to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for we walk by faith and not by sight second corinthians chapter 5 Verse number seven. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 2 Corinthians. In this beautiful book, Paul will defend his apostleship and along the way offer a great deal of encouragement and hope to the Christians in Corinth. And friend, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study of the Word of God today. We hope that if you don't have your Bible ready and handy, that you'll locate that and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God together today. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by congregations and members of the Churches of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You'd be their honored guest. You'll find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who are committed to the Scriptures, and who are concerned about souls. And friend, we just hope that you'll stop by and visit them at any of their assemblies. And if you've got a Bible question or you'd like to study the Word of God more, they'd be happy to sit down and study with you. Friend, we also want to help you in your spiritual journey here at the Gospel of Christ. We're concerned about souls. We want more than anything men and women to go to heaven, and we want to help you in that endeavor. Uh, won't you check out our website? thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can find a wide variety of good Bible study material, uh, audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, articles, just a good variety of Bible study materials available free of charge. You can download all of our lessons from our website free of charge, or if you'd like to have a DVD or a CD of today's lesson or any lesson, we'll provide that to you free of charge. We'll even pay the postage to get it to you. And friend, we want you to know today that in studying the Word of God together, we count it a privilege that you've joined us today, and we hope that each one of us will be uplifted and encouraged by the Word of God. I know today we're going to be because our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 through 7 is such a practical, encouraging part of the Scripture. And friend, we begin with such a powerful principle found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, and it's this. As Christians, we have got to uh, distinguish and make it a part of our everyday life that we're not this earthly house, the temporary side, this body is not where our time and effort and energy, not where the majority of our focus needs to be. This is the temporary side, the temporary home. We need to focus on the eternal. Notice what Paul says in these beautiful words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. The Word of God says this. Paul says, For we know, listen to the confidence, we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. A well, friend, Paul is offering confidence, but there's also a great truth there. When Paul says, we know that if this earthly tent, our house is destroyed, friend, let's realize a powerful truth there. We know that one day that's going to happen for all of us. This earthly tent, our house, one day is going to be destroyed, meaning... It's appointed a man wants to die. Then the judgment, Hebrews 9, verse 27. And Paul says, here's the, based on that idea, here's the confidence we have. We know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, that's not all there is. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Friend, this touchable, tangible, corruptible part of me and corruptible part of you is not all there is to me and you. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, the flesh will return to the dust of the earth, but the spirit is going to return to God who gave it. Yes, our body is going to go into the grave, John 5, verse 28 and 29, but that's not the part that stays there. 
or that's not all that goes into the grave. The Bible says when we leave this life, John 5, 28 and 29, that all are in the grave will one day come forth, the spiritual side of man. That's where we need to put the focus and the emphasis. Let's not make everything in this life about the temporary. For the temporary is going to fade away, but there is a spiritual side of each one of us. And that's what's going to survive forever. Our spirit will return to God. And friend, that offers great comfort and hope to us. When we lose a loved one, when we face challenges and difficulties in life ourselves, what is it that, that keeps us from not throwing in the towel? Well, friend, it's this. We know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we've got a building made from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There's something greater waiting on the spiritual side for each and every one of us. But for that to be ours, we've got to desire that. We've got to want that. We've got to be, want to be clothed with, Paul will say, the spiritual side more than the physical side. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to look at the rest of what Paul says in verses 2 through 4. The Bible says this, For in this, in the fact that we've got a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, Paul says, In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, our home, which is from heaven, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be naked. Found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up with life. There's language there that if we're not careful, we can become confused on, but all Paul is saying this is this. Right now we live in the temporary side. In this temporary body, we long for and look forward to the day that we can shed off this old physical wore out body and put on that spiritual body. Philippians 3 verse 20 and 21, the Bible says when the Lord Jesus comes, we will be like Him. We will have that body that's not going to fade away. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 through 57. Do we understand every detail and fact? Don't even begin to fathom every detail and facet about it. But friend, how wonderful it is to know we've got a habitation not made with hands, built by God Himself for our spiritual self. And in that, we'll be there forever. Friend, that's the encouragement every child of God has. Don't, here, here's the words of encouragement Paul is offering. Don't put your hope and your trust and all your effort and energy into the temporary. Let's prepare the spiritual man for eternal life with God forever. And friend, to do that, we kind of have to be homesick for heaven. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 6. The Bible says this. Paul says, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Friend, if, if I'm going to re really make it my focus to go to heaven, I've got to realize right now there is a sense of, of absence and separation from the Lord. But Jesus said, There's a day coming when we can be with God forever. He said this, and it offers so much encouragement to the child of God. I go to prepare a place for you. Listen to this now. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive it to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. There's a day coming when we put off this old physical body that we can be with God and live with God forever. And friend, we ought to long for and look forward to that day. Here, you know, a lot of times I think we have a, a skewed idea of death. And, and, and please don't think that I'm saying I want to die. That's not the idea. But friend, death is not for the child of God that dark, dismal uh, day of despair. How does the Bible look at the idea of death? Here's what the scripture says. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. This is why Paul will say next in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Based on these ideas, Paul says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. I'm not putting my focus on the touchable, tangible, feelable, everything I see in the here and now. That's not 
where our focus, that's not what we need to look forward to. We need to walk by, we need to live faithfully to God by faith that this is not all there is, that there's something greater coming, and that if I live faithful to God, Revelation 2 verse 10, be faithful unto death, I will receive the crown of life. And so don't just put your hope in what you see. Put your hope in faith in the Word of God and what God's told us about there being a greater home on the other side. And friend, let's let that motivate us to walk and live properly before the Lord. You say, what do you mean walk and live properly? Paul tells us what that means in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 10 and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God and also trust are well known in your consciences. Based on faith, we know there's a day coming where we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says in view of that, Let's walk and live properly. One day, I'm going to give an account for the things I've done in the body. Friend, if you're a child of God and you've obeyed the gospel, anything I've done that's not correct has been washed away in the blood of Christ. Acts 2 verse 38, Acts 22 verse 16, uh, multiple other passages would teach that if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All has become new. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. If I'm trying to walk in the light, 1 John 1 verse 7, and I'm doing my best to live in faith in view of the promises of God, then friend, the things I've done in this body have been taken care of by the blood of Christ. That doesn't mean I've got a license to sin, but I know I've been forgiven. But friend, if I stop walking in the light, if I stop focusing on the eternal, if I get caught up in sin, I need to be reminded there's a day coming where I'm going to give an account for the things done in the body and I need to make sure that I'm living and walking the way I ought to live and walk. And friend, how important that is as we view our heavenly home. Now, as we think about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we also want to notice these principles. In this context, Paul tells us not only what we ought to be focusing on, but what it is that uh, motivates, that, that encourages us to focus on the eternal. We've talked about heaven. We've talked about living right. We've talked about doing that by faith. What is it that when, when life gets hard, when we have so many challenges, what is it that is going to push us on in that direction? Notice the words of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15. The Bible says this, for the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for them who died for live for him who died for them and rose again. Friend, when we think about the motivating factor that rises to the top, it is the love of God. What is it that, that motivates us to want to live right? Friend, there's no doubt that, that fear is a motivating factor. But it's not the fear of God that motivates me the most. I am motivated to live for God, to want to go to heaven, to put my focus on the eternal based on the amazing love of God. Just stop and think about how much God loves you. The Bible says He does love each of us on an individual level. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Cast all your cares upon Him. Listen now. He cares for you. God so loved the world, He gave His only Son for me and you. John 3 verse 16. God, all the way back to the beginning of time, began to implement a plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. He allowed His only Son to come to this earth to be mocked, beaten, spit upon, laughed at, made fun of, and to hang on a cruel cross and die for each one. Think about this for a moment. God intentionally and willfully allowed His Son to do that for each one of us. Friend, if that isn't love, there are no stars in the sky, the sparrow cannot fly, and the ocean is dry. That's the epitome of real love. 
And friend, that's what ought to motivate when Paul says the love of Christ compels us. That word compels is, is the word literally in that language propels. It's like a propeller on a boat. What is it that is the force driving that boat? The propeller is pushing that. What is it that propels Christians forward to keep running the Christian race? The love of Christ compels us. And friend, it's that idea of being ready to go home that brings such joy and hope to each one of our hearts. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17 with me for just a moment. The Bible says this, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Friend, I've been given a second chance. You, if you're a Christian, have been given a second chance. And because of that, by that second chance, we ought to be motivated with joy to live for God. This is why Paul could say, Rejoice in the Lord always. Everything Paul had done prior to becoming a Christian was his old life. Once he was in Christ, the old was put in the past, and he got a second chance. How true that is for each one of us, and thus, Christ is the reason we have that hope and we can look forward to going home to be with God. You know, when I think about all that Christ did, all that He gave up, all that God allowed Him to go through, I'm reminded of the words of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Look at this beautiful text with me. Here's what the Bible says. For God, for He, God, made Him Christ, listen to this, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What's the reason that we get to look forward to heaven? Why do I have the joy and hope of Christianity? Friend, it's all because of Christ. God made Christ, who knew no sin, who was perfect. He committed no sin, nor was God or deceit found in His mouth. 1 Peter 2, verse 25. God made Him who knew no sin to be a sin offering for me and for you. I can't help but think about the beautiful words of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Friend, in view of all that, the encouragement that Paul is going to mention next and the encouragement that we offer today is, oh, this is something that you ought to take advantage of now. If Christianity is this good, if we're looking to afford to something far greater, if we can have this kind of hope and joy and, and motivation, wouldn't you want to take advantage of that now? And that's the key word in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2. Notice the use of that word now. Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, We then as workers together with God, with Him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Now watch this. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul did not say, When everything fits in your life and is running perfectly. Paul did not say, Tomorrow. Like uh, or a, a more convenient time, like Felix or Agrippa did. Paul said, God has planned this in an acceptable time, in an acceptable way. And Paul says, let me tell you when that is. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Friend, why is the word now so important in this idea, in this verse? Here's why. Did you realize, do we realize now is all I'm guaranteed? James 4 verse 14 says this, What is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Psalm 90 verses 10 through 12, we've got, if we're lucky, 70, maybe 80 years upon this life. Uh, Hebrews 9 27, it is appointed a man once to die and then the judgment, and don't be like the man. In Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21, the Bible says there was a, a man who had a great crop year. 
He began to talk to himself and he said, Soul, you've got many goods laid up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. You know what the Bible says in that? When we think about that man, the Bible says, God said to that man, You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you have acquired? And the Word of God says, So is he who is rich, but not in godliness. You know, that man, he had a lot to think about, but he never thought about his soul. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. How do you take advantage of obeying the gospel? A friend, by, by doing what they did in the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached about Christ. And they were cut to the heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They believed that message. And Peter told them, You need to repent be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And the Bible says, Those who gladly received His word were baptized, and the Lord added to His church daily. Those are being saved. And so while we have time, while we have opportunity, the promise of, of now is all we've got, don't let this opportunity pass you by. And friend, as we think about that idea, too often people are restricted from doing the Lord's will by their own affections and desires. Too many times we don't take advantage of now because we let things we want get in the way of what God wants us to do. Let me illustrate. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 12. Some were being restricted, and why was that? Paul says in verse number 12, You're not restricted by us, listen to this, but you are restricted by your own affections. Scan the New Testament for just a moment and think with me about some people who didn't take advantage of now. Rich young ruler came to Jesus with a great question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, hey, all those I've done from my childhood. Uh-oh. One thing you lack, sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. That man went away sorrowful. Why? He had great possessions. That man let his affections for the world get in the way of putting God first. Go away for now. When I've got a more convenient time, I will call upon you. Almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Acts 24, 25. Acts 26, 28. What kept Felix and what kept Agrippa? from obeying the gospel. Very likely some type of affection that they weren't ready to let go of. Friend, when we know what we need to do, when we realize the importance of our, our soul and our spirit, we have to ask ourselves, what keeps us from taking that step in obeying the gospel? Don't let love of the world, don't let love of sin, don't let other affections, don't let anything get in the way of us putting God and His kingdom first. And friend, for sure, don't let people of the world talk you out of doing that. Don't let people of this world uh, talk you into doing things that are not right. The Bible will put this in this terminology. The Bible tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Verse chapter 6, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 14 through 17. Paul says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God. Uh, for you are a temple of the living God, as God has said. I'll dwell in them, walk among them, I'll be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, God says, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Friend, one of the things for sure we don't want to let people of this world do is talk us into not obeying the gospel. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, think about an unequal yoke this way. It's a, it's a farming illustration. You've got... Two oxen hooked to a yoke. They need to be of the same stature and strength. That way they can pull equally. What if you had a 1,200-pound oxen and a 500-pound oxen hooked to a yoke? Well, that 1,200-pound oxen is not only going to have to pull the yoke and uh, not only going to pull the plow and you, he's going to have to pull that other 500-pound ox along as well. Why? Because he can't carry his life. Don't be pulled along by people who are not putting God first. Friend, don't let the world, don't let Satan, don't let ungodly people 
pull us in the wrong direction. Instead, let's turn to God in godly sorrow and repentance and do what's right. Here's what 2 Corinthians 7 verse number 10 says. The Bible says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Friend, if I realize that my sins have broken the heart of God, Ezekiel 6 verse 9, if I realize things that I've done that are, are not right in the sight of God, then I want to be sorrowful about that. I want to turn to God in repentance and the goodness of God does lead us to repentance. Romans 2 verse 4 says, Joel said in Joel 2 verses 13 and 14, rend your hearts, not your garments. Don't just have an outward expression. Don't just shed a lot of tears. Rather, turn to God in real repentance. Change your life. That's what God wants us to do. And so, friend, we hope today that each one of us have been encouraged by that eternal home. We hope we've been encouraged by looking forward to heaven and, and focusing on the things that are right and putting our hope in God and His Word. Friend, we ask you today, are you a child of God? You say, well, I'm not, but wait a minute now. Now, we've already learned, now is the accepted time. Today is the time. I would do it, but no, we've already learned. Don't let your affections restrict you from obeying the gospel. Your soul is too important. If you're not a child of God, we want to encourage you to become one today. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? John chapter 8 verse 24. Would you turn from sin and turn to God? Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Matthew 10 verse 32 and 33. And would you be immersed in water to be forgiven of sin? Acts 2 verse 38. And if you are a child of God, then, friend, the encouragement today is keep focusing on heaven. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. And may each one of us live our lives in such a way that one day we'll have the joy of hearing these words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. We hope you'll join us next time as we're going to study the beautiful book of 2 Corinthians again. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.